Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. On this episode, we're joined by Chris Barker and Darren Nash, who, along with Dave Hone and a number of other paleontologists, have written a paper released today. That's right, this is a podcast world exclusive because this new paper describes two brand new species of dinosaur discovered in the UK. So you're going to hear Dave give a bit of background on that, and then Chris Barker and Darren Nash will take over. And if you're enjoying this episode, do please thank the Patreon who support us on Patreon. Without you guys, this series would never have happened. Hello and welcome back to series number, is it five now, Dave? Five. I think so. <laughs> our five blooming series of Terrible Lizards and we're starting off our inaugural fifth season episode oneness with a bang because this episode is coming out a few hours late because we want to be there the day that your new paper is released. And it's not just your new paper, is it, Dave? No, there's um, eight or nine of us on there and I'm I'm in the middle of the authorship rather than the lead author or the senior author who ran the project. But we will have Chris Barker, the lead author, and Darren Nash is on the paper as well coming up. So you'll have... And Darren Nash is like all over Twitter and he's on Tetsu and stuff. So like, he's awesome. Well, we've definitely mentioned more than once before if we've been if if you're at all interested in dinosaurs even if you only listen to this podcast you, you'd have come across darren before uh but yes the three of us with you of course will be talking about the big sexy new paper but before we get there it's usually if we give a little bit of background on what we're doing and what we've done and why we've done it yeah this is about the isle of Wight, i think and about the dinosaurs on the isle of Wight. and i'm very excited because not a lot happens on the isle of Wight, and i think the isle of Wight needs also a very special show Shout out. Not normally. So yeah, so so for the non-British people, the Isle of Wight is a fairly small island off the south coast of England. It's magnificent. You get there by a ferry. Yeah, it's 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 a kind of famous holiday resort because it's close to Southampton and Portsmouth and it's barely close to London in the grand scheme of things. So you could go there and there's beaches and rock pools and golf courses and various attractions. But it's also a kind of continuation of a large number of the fossil beds that come down the eastern side of the UK uh, and lots of them come out there. And so the Isle of Wight is one of the most productive locations for dinosaur fossils in the UK and has been for a very long time. And uh, there's lots of iguanodon footprints there's lots of trackways there um but there's some nice fossils and not just dinosaurs there's pterosaurs as well uh so uh pterosaur istiodactylus is from there there's oh its name has dropped out of my head a tiny uh tiny edge darkoid that darren named a few years ago and i can remember the species name is daisy morrisi because it was named after daisy a, morrisi <laughs> well uh, but yeah just one of her eyes not the other one yeah but da- 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 daisy morris was like five or six when she found this fossil and it turned out to be a really cool tiny pterosaur um so there's you know loads and loads and loads of stuff has come out of there and as we will hear shortly we have some more exciting new stuff that has come out from there i think a lot of british people who don't really pay attention to dinosaurs think oh well, dinosaurs are american all the good beds are in america and that's what they think they don't know about the big discoveries of dinosaurs that have happened in the uk yeah so we've we've got an episode coming of course where we talk more about the kind of early history of dinosaurs and that really is a British topic. You know, the earliest dinosaur species were all from the UK. Uh, the earliest people working on them and naming them and describing them. It, it's all British paleontology from the 1820s, 1830s. And of course, the same time Mary Anning was digging stuff up in the south coast as well. And we're getting lots of marine reptiles and indeed early pterosaurs and stuff like this. Um, so there is a great British history to dinosaurs. And the Isle of Wight are, is a part of that, though the early stuff was coming out um, more in the Oxford uh, and Sussex area and indeed that's where Baryonyx comes from and Baryonyx uh, is really because I met A.D. Doyle who is like he's one of the people he wasn't a big like the head or of anything he was literally digging um, he, he used to work at the Natural History Museum and now works at the British Museum and yeah he was one of the people actually digging a whole new species of dinosaur out of the earth yeah and and that was a massive thing when it happened so I'm just about old enough to remember this because I, I want to say it was like, uh, 1984 1985 um so it was you know all the news blue peter again for international people a very deal. famous long running kids show very big deal. this was a big deal that this thing was found was found and and described um and it was 
you know, the, actually at the time, probably the first big carnivorous dinosaur with a decent amount of skeleton that had actually been found for quite a long time and was also at the time one of the most complete British dinosaur skeletons full stop pretty much. Um, so it was a really seriously big deal. And at the time, it was thought to be an extremely weird animal that was very different to other theropods known. Where was it found? Yeah, East Sussex. Yeah, Baryonyx came out of Sussex, so in the southeast of England, from a quarry found by a guy called William Walker. So Baryonyx is Baryonyx Walker I, so again named after him. Baryonyx means heavy claw because one of the first things that was found was this very large claw, uh, unusually large. Uh, the tip's broken off, unfortunately, but I've, I've been lucky enough to get into the NHM and I've held and worked on that thing. And it is it's massive, <laughs> even compared to what you see on a lot of other <laughs> sizable theropods. Um, and so that was the, the kind of distinguishing feature that gave it its name. But even in those very earliest days, so an early description came out of it in 1985-1986 by Alan Cherrig and Angela Milner, both at the Natural History Museum at the time, people went, oh, it, it looks like a weird crocodile. Are you sure it's a dinosaur? Because what we now know, but didn't at the time, is that Baryonyx is a spinosaur. And of course, we oh. covered... Spinosaurus is a big deal of our opening uh, so not just too to long ago. Summarize Spinosaurus for those of you who don't know about that and haven't listened to that episode. Uh, basically, Spinosaurus is a large carnivorous uh, predator with a long face, a bit like a crocodile, but also the Spinosaurus, the ones that were in North Africa, had a big fan along their back and yeah. a big, and lots of people think that they were aquatic. Uh, we think they are so well, To be honest, I think not many people think that. Know, lots of people um, were affected by an earlier paper which made them yes, sound aquatic so and made them sound like they were hunting and now this has been revised by Holtz and Hone Hone who is the man I'm speaking to right now uh, who who make them out to be yes they could swim but they probably weren't doing that to be a predator but they were big they were scary looking they're in the Jurassic Park film the original Jurassic Park 3 Spinosaurus is the, is, is the big bad dinosaur um, and yeah so, you know, Spinosaurus even now with some of the new material which has come out of North Africa is not known from a lot of stuff. Mainly because the original fossil got bombed during the Second World War. <laughs> yes, true, but also even that wasn't very complete. This this is a common problem with spinosaurs. So we do have spinosaurs. Um, I was going to say we, we talked about this in the in the paper in the later. A little well. bit. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Let, let me restart. Um, so yes, it's a common problem with spinosaurs actually as a whole that their fossils are really very incomplete. And Baryonyx kind of stands out as a result of that, although not being exceptionally complete. We've got a good chunk of skull we've got some nice neck and um base of the tail kind of vertebrae we've got nice bits of the arms bits of the legs and ribs and plenty of other bits and bobs knocking around it's arguably the best single skeleton still um but the spinosaurs as a whole can be split into two subgroups one of which is the spinosaurines which are what you've described which are particularly large you know t-rex size 10 12 15 meters ish in length with that big sail on the back and the baryonychines which lack that sail. That is by far and away the biggest difference between them. They do have rather longer spines on their back than do other theropods, but they don't have anything beginning to approach what, you know, they, they might have a basic little bit of a ridge going along the back, but they're not going to have this giant expansion. But there's some other differences going on too. So they both have this very superficially crocodile-like head that's very long and very thin laterally side to side, but quite deep top to bottom, um, with loads of very conical teeth in them and a kind of big notch at the front. Spinosaurus has re, and sorry, I should say Spinosaurines have these really big bat teeth in them and the Baryonychines tend to have much, much smaller teeth. Oh. Baryonychines have something like twice as many teeth in the jaw as Spinosaurines do. So although they're clearly doing the same general thing, you would probably think that Baryonychines are focusing on smaller fish and smaller prey in general and Spinosaurines are probably going after bigger stuff. Um, the original Baryonyx was found with armoured fish scale in its stomach, which showed traces of acid etching, pretty good indicator that it was eating fish, uh, but famously was also found in association with bones of a juvenile iguanodon, or iguanodon-like animal, implying it was eating baby dinosaurs as well. Eating everything. Um, and, Greedy. Right, and we've talked about this for, for Spinosaurus, Spinosaurus specifically, but I think it's true of the Spinosaurus as a whole. I think both Baryonychines and Spinosaurines are doing very similar things, in part because anatomically, in general, they are very 
very, very similar. For all the kind of weird specializations that Spinosaurus has, it's got the fan on the back, it's got this weird tail, it's got some oddities in its feet and its bone structure, it is still more similar to Baryonyx and the other Baryonychines than anything else. By some margin, you know, they have a huge number of weird traits in common. Position of the eyes, the position of the nostrils, the shape of that skull, the shape of the brain case that encloses the brain. A study on the jaw mechanics of both show that they operate in very similar ways despite some differences in structure. Partly because Spinosaurus is so big, it actually ends up acting... It, it looks different, but because of the way mechanics scale, they end up functioning very similar to each other. Um, so yeah, Baryonyx, when it was discovered yeah, in the 80s, was this big new discovery. It was a British dinosaur, in Britain particularly exciting. It's, again, not very complete, but in the grand scheme of things, we had a good skeleton of it. And as time went on and more and more bones were uncovered, we realised just how much of it we had. Anyone who's been to the Natural History Museum in London, there's still, to this day, a fairly large section towards the end of the little dinosaur hall about Baryonyx specifically, and they use it as their model, quite literally their model for like how we uncover specimens and what we do. And you can see like people's original notebooks and tools that are there. Uh, and while uh, I want to say that I don't think any of the original bones are on display, there's a really nice like kind of half mount, in other words, like the left side of the body uh, stuck to the wall near the exit. And you can see, see the full size and scale of this animal and realize just how big it actually is. Again, we talked about just, you know, Spinosaurines are giant. They are some of the biggest theropods that we have. But the Baryonychines are right up in the ballpark of big theropods. Um, Baryonyx is, I want to say, eight to ten meters long, probably. And it's arguably still got a bit of growing to go. I mean, so it's going to eat baby iguanodons. And if humans were about, it'd have a go. I, I'm sure it would have a go. Yeah, it's got, you know, it's got this pretty narrow skull. But again, you know, there are big crocodiles whose heads would be smaller than Baryonyx. And we certainly know what they do to people. So why on earth this thing num, wouldn't? Num, num, yeah. Num. Right, and these, you know, and these big, strong arms with these huge claws. Okay, we now know that's a spinosaur feature to actually have a disproportionately large claw on the first finger. Um, we didn't know that at the time. It was a baryonyx unique trait, which we now know is a part of a bigger pack. Cool. Considering it was such a massive find, and it did make the news everywhere. This was this was big. Yeah, and, and as a British dinosaur, to find other dinosaurs in Britain is this equally as big? What? As in, As what in we're about the, to talk the about. The thing we're oh. about to talk about without pulling too many, too many. Well, we got to basically say the paper is naming two new species. It's a very big deal. Yeah, we, we've got we've got two new. I and mean, the reason we've been talking about Baryonyx and Baryonychines is we got two new Baryonychines from the Isle of Wight. Are we going to get a lot uh, of hate now from people saying you can't just make up stuff? Well, I am. You're all right. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a pretty big deal. I mean, as we'll discuss, that they're, they're nothing like as complete as Baryonyx, sadly. There are quite a few British dinosaurs. We're still finding new stuff we have done in recent years. There was this really nice um, little coelophysoid that turned up a few years ago in the south coast of Wales. Um, various things have been reclassified and redefined and things that we didn't think were new turned out to be. Um, so British dinosaurs are still trucking along. Um, but these are some of the biggest and most interesting animals for a while. And the fact that they are close relatives of Baryonyx, which is itself an interesting animal and part of Spinosaurs, which are very interesting animals, um, obviously adds to that. And, and we'll be blunt, people tend to like big carnivorous dinosaurs <laughs> more than small herbivorous dinosaurs. I know I have many colleagues who will be annoyed at that, but they'll also admit that it's true. Don't worry, Dave's <laughs> colleagues. We're going to make up for this because we're going to cover in the rest of the series loads of small tiny herbivorous boring dinosaurs I promise and maybe she called them boring not me maybe even at Izzy a stegosaurus <laughs> <laughs> or two, maybe, mm. maybe we get yeah. loads of requests for Stegosaurus, and Dave's holding out. It's you know, D Dave's now increasingly holding out because people keep answering. He's just being a contrarian pain. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dave, um, why don't we go and speak to uh, Darren Nash and Chris Barker? 
Dave, we've got like the paleontologists are doing that thing in a petri dish where they're just uh, just increasing in front of me, and there's like three of you here, and oh my goodness, there are so many. We're, we're joined by the wonderful Chris Barker and Darren Nash, who have done a paper which Dave has helped out with a, lot, a little bit. I think he's wrote his name on it, but that's it. So, Darren, could you tell me exactly how this all began? Tell me the story, please. Okay, so as uh, as you will know. Um, and most of your listeners will know the Isle of Wight is, you know, rich dinosaur bearing, you know, place and uh, very frequently new specimens are found among the dinosaurs that we hope might come out of the uh, these rocks on the Isle of Wight um, are relatives of Baryonyx, which, of course, was found in Surrey in the uh, mid 80s, in 1984. Or 83. 83. Um, thank you. And uh, I love this. We've got self correcting going on. It's good. So there have been bits, bits and pieces. When the big, like, definitive monograph, you know, the big study on baryonics was published in 1997. We've got a date right there, Chris. Yeah. yeah, yeah thanks so yeah. much. Um, they, Charrig and Milner, the two scientists who did that, they said, oh, it turns out there's lots of, like, little bits and pieces, like teeth and stuff from throughout the whole of the English early Cretaceous that probably pertain to baryonyx like dinosaurs and they said these are probably all baryonyx but because they're not like from the same place and they're not the right same age as the actual original specimen there's always been this idea that hmm, could they actually be not necessarily baryonyx itself but close relatives fast forward to between 2013 and 2017 and various new bits and pieces of new baryonyx like dinosaurs have been discovered at Chilton Chine on the southwest coast of the Isle of Wight the initial assumption was from those of us looking at them was these are probably going to be like i don't know a new species of baryonyx or <clears throat> yeah a new species of baryonyx but what we have found in our study is surprisingly they're different in you know all their little technical details different enough for us to say they're different from baryonyx they are two new close relatives of baryonyx so two new british spinosaurid dinosaurs that is pretty awesome. And what what have you called them? I should ask Chris this, shouldn't I? Because you you've been the one I've understood, Chris. This is this your PhD? Uh, yeah, yes, it's the main bulk of my PhD. Yeah. Um, wow. So did you get to like complete dibs on the names? Is that? Oh no, no, I'm definitely not senior <laughs> enough to be doing that. Um, it was a sort of joint effort. We sort of threw about three names between us and then you know our colleagues who are not with us today. And they're not dead, but they're not here on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah, yeah there's, I think there's eight, eight or nine authors on the paper and we've eliminated them, thus increasing our credit massively. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we threw, but threw, threw a few names together and, you know, came up with a couple which we liked and they stuck. Uh, so we called the, one of them Ceratosucops inferodios and the other Repara Veneta Milneri, uh, of course, in honour of Angela Milner. Oh, wow. So that, that's a really lovely thing because she passed away, didn't she, recently? Yes, sadly. Yeah, just in the last, yeah, just in the last few weeks. And as, yeah, as Darren said, you know, she was the original describer of Baryonyx and Baryonyx was the animal that basically kind of is a Rosetta Stone for Spinosaurs as a whole. And yeah, that 97 monograph has been cited God knows how many times and he's like absolutely foundational to research in that field. So it was absolutely appropriate when, when we heard the news that she'd passed away. I think five of us all separately emailed each other saying we should name this after her. It's really lovely. Is the Baryonyx the same one that's still in the Natural History Museum in London? Is that right? Is that the same that's yeah, the yeah, same the, thing? Yeah. Is that yeah, one? If you're if you're old then you'll remember in the eighties when it was when it was brand new and it was like a huge you know it was nicknamed Claws and it got a TV it got a, a TV documentary all about its discovery and the the Natural History Museum published a book about it it was in all the newspapers all the tabloids it was a huge find because you know wow England can still yield exciting new dinosaurs Charig and Milner the two scientists behind it they were saying it's a theropod but it's entirely new it's not like anything we've ever seen before it's you know an entirely new family and uh, a, I, a big part of the baryonic story for me is that that was what Charrick and Miller was saying is something entirely new but immediately you had other dinosaur experts saying this animal looks a lot like Spinosaurus and as as you know you've covered it before Spinosaurus itself was destroyed you know destroyed in the second world war so Charrick and Milner's take was that you can't say it's anything to do with Spinosaurus because we don't have any Spinosaurus to compare it to 
It, it, it did turn out, obviously, you know, Baryonyx is indeed a Spinosaur. And as Dave said, the Rosetta Stone, because it's, it was our first good look at what Spinosaur rids in general look like. Okay, Baryonyx doesn't have a dorsal sail like Spinosaurus itself. It belongs to a different group within the Spinosaurids. But yeah, foundational for establishing the look of these animals. So that Baryonyx, which is in the um, Natural History Museum, how do these new two specimens differ? And what can you tell us about them? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's absolutely Chris's department. Though the one thing I will say, but in advance almost, is that the really neat thing about these two things is although inevitably they're not that complete, we're not revealing two complete skeletons, the key bits of the skull, we have the same bits for both of them and for Baryonyx. So we can absolutely uh... compare the exact same bits of all three. If we had the head of one and the tail of another, it would be very hard hard to say that there were two there but we've got the exact same bits of the skull for all three so that makes it so 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 much easier and now chris will explain exactly what we've done <laughs> <laughs> we uh yeah we compared the the three together and uh to lesser extent Suchomimus, a slightly harder specimen to get hold of because it's still not being published uh to any great length um and they sort of differ in sort of arguably subtle in some cases, less subtle in others, uh, aspects of the sort of pre so the, the, the bone at the tip of the snout and uh, the brain case. So Ceratosuchot, for example, has a pair of like really sort of small tuberosities right in front of where the nostril is. Tuberosity? What is that? Like a little bony lump. Okay, I've got a few of them. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> right in front of the nostril, which I was unable to find in any other dinosaur, let alone any other spinosaurid. Admittedly, the premax are outside of Baryonyx and Suchomimus aren't exactly that great. Um, Bar- uh, Reparvernit had a bunch of stuff in, in the brain case particularly uh, and it differed from Baryonyx, for example, in the, in the sort of shape of the of the, the nasal horn, shall we say, the, the cruciform process. Yeah, they have these kind of little crests in the middle of the head kind of sort of between the eyes, um, which has been a key feature of Spinosaurus as a whole. Of course, loads of theropods have these features, which we think are probably display features. But yeah, they're, they're all different, which is... Is quite indicative of <laughs> what you'd expect in different species, just as we tell Ceratopsians apart by all their different horns. It's the same thing going on here. And and what was this one like? This is this on the Ripper one? The Ripper event, yeah. So that, that's a little slight, like a slightly different dorsal margin. So the sort of the, the curvature in this case of the horn compared to a slightly straighter edged one. Give us give us an idea roughly what it would have looked like. Are we talking like um a fan? Are we talking like a spike? Are we talking what we're talking yeah, about? Yeah, the the process itself, the that cruciform process I was talking about is probably a I guess sort of triangular kind of flattish horn, uh, which then was obviously I think it was embedded in keratin, most probably, um, giving it slightly a bit like a claw. Yeah, like a claw. Yeah. So technically speaking, the keratin above it could have been sort of any shape, but the bony core itself uh, was relatively triangular. Triangular. I just want to inspire all the paleo artists out there. It could be any shape. Uh, that's yeah. officially. Have I, have I, have I, have I done a thing with that? Tyrus <laughs> shaking his head, going no. Uh, that's not what he said. It's yes. not what he <laughs> at, at least yeah. two meters long. At least two meters. Yeah, long. yeah. <laughs> so the bits we've got of these two new dinosaurs, if we've got snout tips and we've got brain cases, comparing them to each other and comparing them to Baryonyx and comparing them to the African animal uh, Suchomimus, it turns out they're 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 same enough for us to know they're the same kind of dinosaur, but they're different in like almost every single little detail. The 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 brain cases, it's like wow, you know, having the two Ripper of and uh ceratosuchops next to each other and to baryonyx as well it's like wow there's just there's so many differences there's no way they can be classed as the same thing even if we allow for the amount of variation that you do have within you know members of a, a dinosaur species so what sort of differences are there because the brain case is literally a bit of bone that encapsules the brain isn't um, that's it? horrible question because it's a horrible question because all of the different terms that we need to talk about when we discuss brain cases are way beyond my capability of understanding. <laughs> no, not your capability. It's like beyond normal lexicon. Like the the basis phenoid webbing is is, is fifty percent deeper in one of them than it is in the other, and the basiocipital, the exocipital contribution to the basiocipital in uh, Ceratosuchops is like more extensive than it is in Ripper of and the what. What what are, what are the sulky? What's is the basis phenoidal sulky yeah, on the on them, the yeah. posterior face of the 
uh, Bates' sphenoid processes are like <laughs> deep and oval. Note that only Darren can do this because even Chris and I just can't remember half these things, let alone which one's which off the top of our head. Well, it's, there's a lot of there's a lot of really cool stuff here. So we don't know anything about um, actual what it means for brain anatomy. That's kind of like a whole nother subject. We haven't really looked into that. But um, these dinosaurs, it turns out all spinosaurids have really, really deep and narrow brain cases. And this was first discovered in Baryonyx and it initially was therefore thought to be a special feature of Baryonyx. Then it turned out to be, no, it's probably like a, a quite a you know, typical spinosaurid feature. But quite why they've got it, is it something to do with them having wanting to have like a, a deep and narrow skull? Is that something to do with, you know, the whole elongation of the snout thing they've gone in for, which is part of their lifestyle? But we don't really know. But but the fact that these, you know, there are two new ones and, and Baryonyx, so they've all got this like deep, narrow brain case with all these weird structures going on at the on the back that are something to do with muscle attachment sites, something to do with the mobility of the, you know, skull relative to the lower jaw and to the neck. It's, it's, it's understudied, basically. Is it because they were like fishing really quickly or something like that and they needed all the muscles? Everybody shrugging at me, just going, could be, who knows? It's the kind of thing you might expect because, yeah, as a whole, we think the Spinosaurus, Baryonyx and Spinosaurus and the others are all doing something fairly similar. They're pretty specialised for what they're doing. It is likely that a whole bunch of adaptations are going on in the head and neck to facilitate that kind of behaviour. I'd be surprised if it wasn't, but exactly what it means is it, does it allow the head to move faster if they're biting? Does it allow the head to stay very still when they're getting ready to strike something in water? I mean, those are very different things, even if they're both in the same intention. If, if, you, look at, if you look at the back of a dinosaur skull, so you've got the whole, the foramen magnum, that's obviously where the spinal cord goes in, connects to the brain. Underneath that, you've got this like ball-shaped structure called the occipital condyle, which is like, that's the ball joint that fits into the cup at the front of the vertebra and allows the animal to move its head relative to the spine. Um, looking at that, on either sides of it, you've got these like rectangular sideways projecting things. They're called parasipital processes. And in normally in, in theropods, they project out sideways like two flanges like that. That's what baryonyx has got. Um, one of our animals, uh, I think it's ceratosuchops. Am I right, Chris, has got, yeah, that, that condition. Oh, no, sorry. No, Ceratosuchops has got the um, posterior projecting. So one, one of them's got that, and the other one's got these parasipital processes bent down really strongly. We've got no idea why this is, but sort of riffing off what Dave just said, and Izzy, what you said as well, um, I think this is all of these structures are something to do with different ways of, like, you know, controlling head, neck movement, controlling, like, yeah, sort of the how heavy things are they lift up their particular fishing style. I mean, that's complete spitballing speculation at the moment. I like that, though. That's what podcasts are for. That's what you can't formally put it in the paper. You can say it here. That's it's a safe space for speculating. So um, are these both then fish eaters, we think, or could they be, la- do they go for more land? Do we know anything about what they were eating? Dave might have published something on this recently. Hey. <laughs> yes. The Infernodios species name is Andrea Cow's contribution. Well, he's made other contributions to the paper, um, but that translates as roughly as hell heron, which goes back <laughs> to that idea of, as I said, the, the kind of stuff that I did, we talked about in the previous series with these as kind of like giant heron or stork analogs and andrea has been using that kind of informal jokey name for spinosaurs already that the, the, the heron from hell and he'd suggested this as a species name and everyone loved it and it's like yep yeah, that 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 fits what we think that they're, they're doing so yeah they're probably these two animals are probably not doing anything in the grand scheme of things that different to baryonyx or Suchomimus or even spinosaurus they're hanging around at the edge of the water they're eating fish but they're probably grabbing crocodiles dials they're probably grabbing small dinosaurs they're probably grabbing anything they can maybe scavenging and that and that's really the kind of big question as darren said these like subtle differences in the skull and things like those paroxysmal processes of is one of them fishing more in rivers and the other more in the sea is one of them better on land than the other one is one of them coming in occasionally and is following the tide or actually is from a chain of islands just off the oh who knows what any of these possible combinations are you know they could be doing the same general thing whilst being really quite separated. I have a question because they both are from the Isle of Wight. Now, are they the same sort of time period or did you have to dig further for them? Are we talking about animals which are alive at the same time? 
So in the paper, we use the term sort of broadly contemporaneous in that both Stratosucops and Riparvanita were found from rocks of the Wessex formation, but quite where within that formation, we're not quite sure. Uh, one was an in situ find, but it was at the base of a what's known as a rotational slump. So the cliff is kind of collapsed, falling, collapsing on itself and rotating. So the whole rock there underneath it's all messed up. And we couldn't get a, a sure reading as to where it is specifically within that part of the cliff. And then broadly contemporaneous in, in that the Wessex formation and the Upper Wheel Clay formation where Baryonyx was found, they're both the same age, give or take. So all three animals are broadly contemporaneous, but within that time frame, we're not quite sure whether they're all neighbours, whether they never interacted. It's a difficult one to, to say until you know, someone has a look at it properly. Could one have hunted the younglings of the other? Yeah, possibly. And vice versa. I mean, I'm sure if you go to America, big crocs will eat baby alligators and big alligators will eat baby crocs if they get the opportunity. I think herons will eat anything, actually. Pretty much. Yeah, so this is this is actually a, a big part of our paper and a thing that we could talk about for a long time. The fact that if we're saying that that these animals are broadly contemporaneous, you know, does that that could mean that they were literally living in the same environment. And to be clear, if they were, that's okay because we know of lots of other, you know, we talk in the paper, uh, we know of lots of other theropod. Um, inhabited environments where there were you know two or three very very similar you know closely related species living alongside one another that's not an unusual idea on the other hand it could be that as as chris said we know they're from the wessex formation so we know they're from this like chunk of rock that corresponds to like you know a few million years but because their exact position in that in that sequence is is uncertain ceratosucops is it was is out of context it was actually found as loose blocks on the beach they could have still lived like one or two million years apart which you know for those of us who work on mesozoic dinosaurs think that a, a million or two years is like you know uh small potatoes it's it doesn't not, really yeah, count they're they're about the same <laughs> age they're two million years apart whereas of course you know you talk to like experts on neanderthals and you know a thing happened two million years ago they're like there are millions of years now because <laughs> because uh, obviously everything you know we know how much things change within tens of thousands of years let alone millions of them so uh and the the bigger picture thing here is that if we're saying that these two wessex formation baryonyx like dinosaurs are broadly contemporaneous if we're, we're happy with the idea that there's two in the same approximate environment we're saying that baryonyx walker itself is approximately the same age and could be you know it could be living like within you know know 100 or 200 kilometers of these two we're saying that in actual fact the evidence from the spinosaur record as a whole everything we know about this whole group of dinosaurs is actually indicative of this is not high diversity two or three species but it is indicative of there being you know two or three species in the environments in which we find them and we're thereby wading yet again into the battle over um the the status of spinosaurus because as you know you've covered before there's this argument that do all the bits and pieces from the whole of north africa all belong to one animal spinosaurus egyptiacus or should we actually you know argue that there's two or three or more spinosaurus b and sigal massasaurus and yeah spinosaurus rockensis yeah. And we come down on we come down on the latter side on the on the idea that in actual fact, because we've actually got you know, a new analysis in the paper, which is uh, quite a big deal. We said no, they they don't necessarily group together. There probably are several uh, different animals included within what some experts call Spinosaurus aegyptiacus. Yeah, I mean the results from that part of the paper were sort of I think we say equivocal. We we're not you know, the, the actual analyses don't show either way. Weak support or something. Weak, weak support yeah. for their monof- yeah. Weak support for their monopoly. I mean for them going together. So um, yeah, and yeah. and that's the opposite problem that we've got here in that so much of that Spinosaurus material is non-overlapping. There's this whole beautiful series of neck vertebrae which has been assigned to a genus called Sigal Massasaurus and several people said oh well it's just Spinosaurus it's like well we barely got any Spinosaurus neck so very hard to say and the bits that we have look fairly different there was that new one just a couple of months ago by Brad McPeters describing yet another just an, just a single isolated neck vertebrae and said it doesn't look like the one assigned to Spinosaurus and it doesn't look like Sigal Massasaurus so <laughs> Either it is insanely variable, which would be weird, or there's multiple species there. This is going to be something that they're going to actually confirm in about 60 years, isn't it? And yeah, by the time we're all dead. And you're going to be either cursed or proven <laughs> correct. 
I think that, so, you know, uh, I, I shouldn't say this on a podcast. It's very rude. But, uh, but some people are, you know, have quite a biased approach to this. They actually, some of the researchers have a model that requires like lots of different fossils to belong to a like one species that that they're because that then proves a theory that they're keen on if they're all from the same dinosaur whereas if they're yeah. from different dinosaurs that would make their theory a bit weaker hey i didn't say it mm. yes. i said it and i'm not a paleontologist so i can't be hurt by all... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. don't, don't worry the, the don't worry the fanboys will be in touch <laughs> But something I realised we didn't mention, which is also quite interesting and important, is although we, we haven't done any detailed study yet on the age of these animals in terms of like their individual ages rather than the geological age, they're all about the same size as each other. You know, we've talked about this before. There's the big problem of juveniles and adults. Things change as they get bigger. Years and years ago, someone suggested that Baryonyx in the UK was just a juvenile version of the bigger Suchomimus in Niger. I don't think anyone really buys that anymore. I'm not sure that many people bought it. Would that time. imply that it would like grow a, a massive sail? No, Suchomimus. So this is the okay. this is the bari- baryonyx like one rather than the Spinosaurus like one. I was going to say that's that sudden puberty that would be if you grow and your back popped. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Suchomimus is quite a bit bigger, so Baryonyx, there's some indication that it's not full adult, it's got a little bit of growing still to go, a bit of maturity, so maybe that was going on. Now that would be an obvious question here is, well, you say there's two different ones and they're different in these ways, but well, what if them does grow into the other or one of them grows into Baryonyx, or even does Baryonyx grow into one of them? They're, as I said, we haven't done a detailed study of the age, but they're all almost exactly the same size. I mean, like Chris and I measured them, like within about 10%, you know, very, very similar sizes indeed. It does depend on the, the element you do measure. And they're equally fused up as well. Yeah, and they they actually have some other traits which suggest they're similar growth stages. So, of course, if one was twice the size of the others and the small ones looked like a juvenile, we'd have to really strongly consider that. But they are, yeah. And pretty pres- much identical. I presume we don't have a cause of death. No, because they are they are too incomplete. We were supposed to be getting samples of baryonyx to compare to them to try and look at the exact age, and COVID kind of got in the way. Um, so unfortunately, that still hasn't been done. Um, but one thing that you know, I think really strongly adds to our argument that they're genuinely different is the fact that they are yeah basically identical in terms of their growth trajectory or in terms of like this growth stage and therefore these differences have to be real as, as in they can't possibly be attributed to this one's finished growing and that one's still a juvenile i was just going to say at this point you probably mentioned that there, there is no universally accepted way of measuring age in non sudorosaurs no <laughs> so even if we did have the samples from from baryonyx not only do we miss the same element in the either white specimens the data you might get out could be a bit scabby yeah it, it's one of those ones where if, if they lined up perfectly we'd go brilliant and if they didn't line up at all you'd go well it's hard to say because the data's a bit wobbly <laughs> alas no birthday cards <laughs> no not no. yet i think you know we've been sort of uh paranoid so that's probably the wrong word we've, we've been kind of like a bit nervous about the prospect of naming two new baryonyx like dinosaurs in such close geological and geographical proximity to baryonyx itself because you know we're all thinking about what the response is going to be from dinosaur specialists there's a there's a general feeling um among dinosaur specialists that um dinosaurs are what we call over split people have like named too many genera and too many species and i that's probably going to be one of the first reactions reactions to this paper but on the other hand you know we toed and froed and toed and froed endlessly on this and like you know did uh, did all the science that we could to sort of work out what 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 we thought was you know going on as according to the data and you know all, all of us will agree that the um the if you can distinguish uh, animals from partial skeletal remains like quite reliably you can really tell that you know that one is different from that one is different from that one it's like bones aren't the only bits of animals you know there's lots of studies of living animals where people have found the skeletons of loads of closely related things are almost identical but that's not what determines whether they're actually different taxa different species or genera it's you know more to do with uh, you know what they look like and what they sound like and what they smell like and stuff so the anatomy isn't the skeleton so the fact that we can distinguish these things reliably means that they're probably more different than we think they are from the bones alone and it sort of strengthens i mean this is this is kind of like speculative ring fence around the actual you know the skeletal material we're working with 
we really shouldn't be ashamed of the fact that it's like no you can tell them apart they are different genera and and who's to you know why why is there this view that dinosaur diversity should be as low as some people think it is because loads of things have to be renamed when you make a mistake that's why and then things get muddled and it annoys people like me and i have to learn a whole new thing well we just do that to annoy you because we like that we like messing up the names oh i know you do <laughs> well the the other thing as well so off the back of darren's point so you know when when we were looking at this and this is just a conversation that chris and i had one afternoon a few years ago tom holtz and i did another spinosaur paper and we looked at in part the taxonomy of all the spinosaurs so spinosaurus and baryonyx and the others and looked through the diagnoses so what other paleontologists had written out to define them and said if it has this feature and this feature and this feature and this feature it's this and if it has this this and this it's that and if you actually look at those lists because tom and i redid them off the back of a bunch of more recent studies and analyses and kind of tried to refine them and update it all we've got about as many differences for these two new animals compared to baryonyx and suchomimus and the others as we do for any of the spinosaurs so this isn't just some you know we've scraped together the minimum number of differences to like get it over the line as chris said there's there's really quite a list when you put it together when you consider the fact that not as darren said it's, we're, we're only working from the bones and not even that we're only working from a frag, you know, fairly small part of the skeleton. There's a pretty big long list certainly more than plenty of other species of spinosaurs and other things that no one has a has a truck with. Yeah, but that's because they're miles apart and millions of years yeah. apart. They're not next door to each other sharing tea. But it's a, you know, and it's a slightly subtle or different argument. And I think people forget this when people have named new species and they go, oh, you've done a bad job. There's, there's obviously one or whatever. It's like, to a degree, it's not just us. Though, of course, we are all taxonomy experts. We've all named theropod dinosaurs before. But, you know, this paper went through review from several of our colleagues as well, and we've shown it to a couple of other people. And I don't think anyone at any point has had a problem with the data and the arguments that we've laid out. It, it, as Darren said, people are going to criticise this, but it's really solid. But no, I've got a question for Chris, because obviously he's been, I was going to say, ankle deep, knee deep, neck deep in Spinosaur and Baryonychine papers for uh, months <laughs> now on this. Um, and obviously is the lead author on this fantastic and amazing and important new paper, which we'll be linking to in the description. That's very, very kind of you. Yeah. What do you think, having been buried in this literature, is the most important or interesting thing that we've actually pulled out? I mean, aside obviously from naming two species, which is you know a pretty big deal from the UK these days, What what is it? Because you I say you've got a, probably a better overview than us of everything right now. Yeah, two things come to mind. Uh, we've not discussed this in that depth yet, but it's the tail. Um, the problem with the reason why we didn't discuss it that much in the paper or on, or on this podcast is that it was very difficult actually comparing it to other Baryonychines. Baryonyx has got about six scabby tail verts uh, assigned to it. Suchomimus has some, but I have not seen any. I've had got pictures about one of them, I think. So actually comparing them in any meaningful way was really difficult for this uh, this part of the project and warrants revisiting. But you've got something like over 20 semi-articulated uh, tail verts uh, some of them show really little tall neural spines. So these are the, the, the sort of tall processes which jut out from the top of, vert- of the vertebra. Um, so the tail is actually really quite deep. And when you look at it, it should be a, an interesting jumping off point, at least, when you look at the stuff from just the Spinosaurus neotype tail. Is that what they've been doing on all the paleo art of the Spinosaur that I've been seeing? Everybody's been putting this massive newt-like tail on the back of it. Is that similar in these then? Yeah, so it's not quite as extreme, shall we say, but you know the, the depth of the tail remains quite extensive, well into the middle series, which is unusual for, for this grade of ther- for tetan urine theropods generally. I'd say it's about halfway between a inverted commas normal theropod tail and the really extreme Spinosaurus one. But then that's still yeah. really quite a surprise, or at least it's very interesting to see that. Yeah, so it'd be good to sort of attempt some sort of A, comparative analysis and B, some biomechanics on that tail. Uh, something which we've been talked about sort of loosely with my supervisor, uh, whether I have the time to do that or find a, a colleague to help us out. It's a different story. Would that involve making a little model and then flapping it in a bathtub? Uh, not quite. <laughs> um, we, we want to do something more advanced than gets you published in Nature. So Okay. <laughs> A big, a big bathtub that they call the flume tank. <laughs> yeah. 
same 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 thing. And then the second cool thing is the uh, the results of the Bayesian analysis, which uh, Andrea Cal uh, kind of did, uh, which showed that spinosaurus have a European origin, or at least the hypothesis we're we're presenting is that. Spice was first evolved in Europe and then dispersed. How on earth can you tell that? Andrew would tell you better than I could, but uh, it's like think think of uh, think of the family tree, and then think of like the dis- the geographic distribution of the members of the family tree. And we, you've got spinosaurs in Europe, like Baryonyx and our new animals. You've got spinosaurs in Africa, obviously Spinosaurus and. Suchomimus. You've got a, a South American one or two, uh, Asian bits and pieces, an ostensible Australian one. And then if you map that distribution onto the family tree, if like all of the oldest kind of earliest diverging members of the group, if they are, let's say, European, then you've got a strong like a European signal. And if, if like, let's say that the family tree shows that all the oldest members of the group are all European, but then clustered in there is like one African one, well, then your hypothesis is, ah, so there was one dispersal event there was like one members of one lineage got out of europe and traveled or swam you know whatever walked whatever to africa that that that's basically it's done with statistics and tons of data but that's basically what it is the fact that you have all, like these three all in one area suggests that they've been in this area for a while. They've enough to speciate, and then after this, they're then going off and having a nice summer holiday. Yeah. So these three are sort of technically the amongst some of the oldest spinosaurid individuals known from skeletal material. So there's teeth, and I think it's just teeth actually. Yeah. There's the teeth from Tanzania that Eric Bufto named as Ost Africasaurus, which might not be spinosaurids. I think they probably are. They're just teeth, so... Yeah, it's exactly, it's teeth. That's usually a bit of a weird one. Yeah. We, but those are the bits that last. They do last. Yeah, but we, we want one of those really nice, distinctive, thin jaws with the big rosette expansion at the end because that's a Spinosaur and nothing else at that point. If we had one of them... It's also important to remember that um, with that analysis, that Bayesian analysis I was talking about, we actually have like an almost 40 million year so-called ghost lineage, and that's like a lineage for a sort of... We know they should be there, but they don't show up in the, in the fossil record. So they're actually the oldest spinosaurus we have, as in Baryonyx or Stratosuchops, are not technically the oldest ones. Uh, I like the idea of a ghost lineage. It gave me chills. That's scary. <laughs> <laughs> if we, we we generally think that spinosaur spinosaurs as a whole, spinosaur rids, are close relatives of megalosaurids, and megalosaurids go all the way back to the early Jurassic. So if spinosaurids and megalosaurids, if they share an ancestor, that ancestor, you know, must be at least as old as the oldest megalosaurid. Currently, we have no Jurassic spinosaur rids at all. There's a few murmurings of like you know, teeth yeah. and stuff that people think might be from Jurassic spinosaurus, but even those are only from the latest uh, Jurassic. Well, there's that one random large claw that's from the Morrison Formation, so late Jurassic USA, which would be the only North American spinosaur, but it's just a claw. And they do have weird claws, but... Again, just like teeth, it's effectively one bit very hard to say with real certainty. Um, yeah, so we're missing that. So, the only also the fact that this is non trivial, even the oldest fossil spinosaurids we have are fully specialized, like true spinosaurids. They belong to either one of these two groups, Baryonychians or Spinosaurines, and they've, they've got the characteristic, you know, long crocodile like head off that we associate with this group. We don't have kind of an archaeopteryx of spinosaurs. We don't have like a, you know, sort of like a, a proto spinosaurid, which is a thing that must exist because obviously this skull shape of spinosaurus is really, you know, specialized, advanced, if you like. We should have like prototype versions of it, halfway house versions. Slightly stubby one. Well, more like, you know, it's halfway between a megalosaur type face and a true spinosaur type face. We should have that. We we don't. We've got nothing. Mm. Nothing yet. But is this just a case of we haven't found it yet? Fossil record being a bit sort of a pick and mix of like dip in and see what comes out. Yeah. Can I jump in here? Because because like because Dave won't mention this because this is well, this is one of my biases, not one of Dave's. <laughs> the um so uh, loads and loads and loads of really key events in dinosaur evolution happened in the middle Jurassic. That if you look at the shape of the family trees, it's like the middle Jurassic was like everything happened in the middle Jurassic, and the middle Jurassic was one of the highest 
sea level times in the whole of history. Sea levels are like the highest ever. And as a consequence, like the terrestrial record of dinosaurs and other animals in the middle of Jurassic is exceptionally poor. It's the fact the UK and Argentina are the, like, I think, uh, and, uh, some obviously, you know, one of the Taoji Shan, China, they're like the only places that have got middle Jurassic stuff. There's like three or four assemblages, just a handful of dinosaurs. And we're like crying out for middle Jurassic fossils. And they literally might not exist for that reason. So, so that's part of it. Another part of it, which these animals and what we've been talking about for the ecology sort of fits something that I said a while ago in one of my papers, and I think other people have said as well, um, is that spinosaurs are kind of weird in that generally they're rare. You find, you know, things like tyrannosaurs absolutely everywhere. They, they definitely get around. Spinosaurs definitely get around. They're around for a good long period of time. We find them, as you say, we've got them in South America, Europe, Africa and Asia, possibly Australia. So they they've got around and yet you don't tend to find many of them until you do. And then suddenly they're really, really common and there's tons and tons and tons of fossils. So they're this, this slightly weird animal in that when conditions are right for them, boy, do spinosaurs do well. When conditions aren't right, you don't see them. And so that means that they're probably, again, talking about these ghost lineage and these gaps, Darren's spot on with that middle Jurassic sea level problem. But it could also be that they're just fundamentally rare for tens of millions of years. And therefore, unless we have fossils from that exact spot and that exact time in that weird little place that they were hanging out we ain't gonna see them so they're not herons so much as bitterns yes <laughs> <laughs> lurking in the reeds it's, it's exactly. a bit like to change the name now booming <laughs> booming going ghost lineage um <laughs> but if they are really overly adapted to be hunting one type of thing and their hunting methods very strict then they're obviously not going to be able to adapt as well as other more you know scavengy type creatures well it's funny this is the is, so I think Dave's published a lot on, so I'm going to beat him to the punch here. But you're, you, you mentioning you mentioning bittens and herons there. Obviously, you're messing around, having a bit of a laugh there. But the piscivory side, sort of this fish eating thing about spinosaurids, has been way overdone. So there's this kind of it's quite common for paleontologists to say, "Oh, this was a fish eating dinosaur. Could only like use aquatic resources." On the contrary, it's like think of like so. Denial crocodiles only eat fish. No, they eat us too if they give a half a chance. Yeah. The most specialised crocodilians, like gharials, those are the, the you know the most fish eating ones. But like spinosaurs in general are kind of, I mean, I don't want I don't want to be guilty of overplaying the crocodilian comparison myself. But the crocodilians that spinosaurs are most like are the ultimate generalists. And what we, we say in this paper, you know, Dave said it in other papers, is spinosaurs are very likely supreme generalists. Yes, 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 they're eating fish. Yes. They're swimming and wading and catching waterside things, but they're also equally well, you know. So this is this is what I, I like the the heron analogy because herons eat fish, yeah, loads, but they don't just eat fish. They eat like mice, rabbits, snakes, um, you know. So uh, that's not an inappropriate analog. I I've seen one eat an ice bun. Yeah, ice well, you know, I mean, that's a particularly dangerous prey <laughs> item. It's, uh, it's you know, you know, eating adders is one thing, but once you're on the, was it a finger bun as well? It was a finger bun. <laughs> it was an iced finger bun from Greg's, I believe. But <laughs> well, that I is didn't... dangerous. <laughs> How strange. So they're incredibly specialised and niche, but also incredibly generalist. And well, they're, they're kind of like specialised generalists, which obviously <laughs> sounds like a contradiction in terms. But, well, this is, again, one of the things we said in the Spinosaurus paper, it, it fits with this, that they're rare until they're common and then they're super common, is that it seems that like certain situations where this ability to exploit land and water at the same time in a way that they're, they're better in water than other theropods and better on land than crocodiles means they fit into this really weird, literally they fit into this weird niche that only they can do. And that niche clearly doesn't come up very often otherwise we'd find them everywhere all the time but when it does they're superlative at it of which is why you then find huge numbers of fossils and it also looks like high diversity well then chaps um so that is your paper it's the best, very best paper um chris can you say their names again so we all remember them because i want, I want and, expl say and explain the names because we didn't actually like translate oh, that's them. true yeah we didn't uh so yes yeah, ceratosuchops uh inferodios so ceratosuchops uh horned crocodile face <laughs> <laughs> Horned crocodile face. Yeah. Nice. But the whole the whole name that Ceratosuchops infrodius is Hell Heron Horned Crocodile Face, which I think is. Yeah. 
Okay. So, and the other one's Nipper. Which one? Rip- Riparo Veneta uh, Milneray. So, Riparo Veneta is, is just Riverbank Hunter and okay. Milneray, as we said, um, in honor of Angela Milner. Yeah, Milner's River Hunter, basically. Oh, that's nice. I mean, I prefer to be a hell heron horny face, but you know. Uh- <laughs> I was going to say, one of the things we haven't discussed is that is the, the actual horns along the, uh, the orbital region of, of Ceratosuchops and presumably other of its kind, the Ceratosuchopsini. Did they have horny eye sockets? Yes, yeah, so one of the weirdest elements, for want of a better word, was this post orbital bone, which sort of lines the back of the eye, eye socket. And it had this really large uh, boss coming off it. And you usually see that in stuff like Carcharodontosaurids and, uh, I guess, Abelosaurids. I like Abelosaurids. Yeah, I think they're really cool as well. But it kind of suggests that the whole sort of orbital region, including that nasal horn we were talking about earlier, was really quite well developed and had sort of keratinous lumps and bumps and, and low horns and stuff. So the whole, I think it was like a, a new aspect to social sexual signaling, which I hadn't appreciated in, in Spinosaurus before, I don't think. At least I didn't. So it's not just a sort of central thing, that it also involves the eye and the forehead sort of yeah. Cool. The central, the central horn was kind of like the yeah. The, the way someone would draw baryonyx, they draw the, the crocodile snouty thing, and then they draw the little horn in the middle of the, the top of the skull. Whereas these guys were showing these sort of really gnarly bosses and, and horns along the side as well, which means that that horn was you know complemented by a suite of, of additional features. You know, in, and in Carl and Ontosaurus, that they they might have a, an antagonistic role. So, what does that mean for Spinosaurid social structure? Are they fighting with them? Are they just displaying with them? I think both. And I thought it was really quite that was quite a cool bone to to have at our disposal. Yeah, like a, a lumpy Klingon forehead scariness. Yes, it, it's very Star Trek alien. Actually, there's. <laughs> If they had a couple more series, I'm sure that'd be the next lumps they'd stick on someone's head. <laughs> well, well done on the paper, everybody. Yeah. Are you happy? Yeah. Where, where, if people did have a, and wanted to, you know, find this in an academic journal, which academic journal is it in? It's in Scientific Reports and it's open access, so go nuts. Excellent. And if you have a problem with saying that they're probably email all the Dave. same thing, um, you know where to you know where to pick your fights. Where everybody's on Twitter, <laughs> as far as I know. Chris, you're on Twitter, aren't you? Yeah, but I'll be avoiding it that day. Okay, well, <laughs> I, think I'm wash- I'm, I think I'm washing my hair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking time off work the whole day. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Just, just keyboard to go, warrior. Actually, actually, <laughs> read it. Uh, that was really great fun. It is nice to see you guys playing well with each other and not attacking. It was good. That's because you're there. <laughs> you didn't see the emails that went around during the editing <laughs> process. <laughs> um, I do. I do want to take the surname Hell Heron, though. I think that is wonderful. Yeah, it's it's an excellent one. H- Hell Heron. What was it? Crocodile eye. No. A horned crocodile face. Serato Sucops Infernadius. Wow. That's- so the Hell Heron with the horned crocodile head, basically. Amazing. Top notch naming there. Top notch. Thank you. So, <laughs> and the other one oh the other one's named after Miriam, wasn't it? Repart yeah, yeah. Repara Venator. Yeah, that's nice. There we have it, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. There will be links in all of the show notes to the paper. Do check it out. Do leave us a comment if you have any questions. We'll be very happy to answer it. We do have a episode at the end of the series where you can ask Dave more questions about this. Um, but yeah, it's really exciting. And um, I do hope that everybody says, oh, no, they didn't make a mistake. And these are actual things. So that's good. I, I stand by my prediction that within an hour of the paper going live, someone will have publicly criticised it online for getting the taxonomy wrong. Since this podcast is about an hour long, if you've listened to it, as soon as it's come out, please log on to Twitter <laughs> and let me and know. And Reddit. And Reddit. Don't forget Reddit. Um, but yeah, no, please do share this episode with your friends and everything else. And thank you again for our patrons. Uh, without them, this episode would not have been possible. So if you want to support us, patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards. Other than that, should we say goodbye? Rawr. This episode of Terrible Lizards was made possible by our generous patrons on Patreon. To support the show and for bonus content, please go to patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards. For links to everything, including merch and past episodes, go to terriblelizards.co.uk. Please follow us both on Twitter. I'm at ISZI underscore L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E and Dave is at D-A-V-E underscore H-O-N-E. Send us your questions either via Patreon or terriblelizardspod at gmail. If you can't afford to support us on Patreon, please do write a review and recommend the show to your friends. Thank you so much for your support. It means a lot to us. 